Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great towards us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise the, the Lord. Let us bow our heads this morning so we can give thanks unto the Lord. God is our all and all. He is our all and all. Thank you, Father God, for loving us, for protecting us, for providing for us your children. We love you, Lord. We love you, Father. We love you, God. We thank you for loving us in spite of our sins and our disobedience. You love us through it all. Our ups, our downs, our good days, our bad ones. And we thank you for that, Father God. We should be more like you. Thank you for your encouragement, Father God, and the availability of your word. The word is available, and we thank you for that, Father God. There's no guesswork about what you intend for us. It's there. And thank you, Father God, for those who take the time to spread your word. We pray for that today, Father God. We pray for them today, the teachers, the ministers, their family, and their friends. We thank you for the power of prayer. And I thank you personally that I know to pray. There's power in the word. Father God, we'd say to our church members, our family and friends, continue to pray. Pray early, Father God. Pray often. God is only a prayer away. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We want to give out a special prayer to our pastor, Spencer Clayton, our first lady, Tia, and their son, Sawyer. To God, the glory. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you. In your precious name, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to our service this morning. We thank uh, those who have uh, who are worshiping with us today. We uh, don't take that lightly. Uh, you can praise a lot of different places, but you're here with us, and uh, that's no accident. I think it's what God intended. So we thank you for being here. And. Um, just to make um, a few little notes, just reminding you of our church uh, picnic, uh, which is uh, August the 27th. Check the flyers, they're out now, uh, and share that information with your family and friends. Come on out and worship with us and have a good time. Uh, have some food, play some games, and of course, keeping God first. So I uh, also, I wanted to, Pastor speaks a lot about things going on behind the scenes. So I just want to mention a few things. Uh, we're gonna thank uh, Sister Michiko for uh, her work uh, in um, black history in and around the Philadelphia area. It's very interesting. It's important to know and learn your history. So we thank her for that. Uh, we will be providing more information uh, coming so that uh, you'll be able to follow her as well. And also we wanna thank our sister, Victoria Crenshaw, 
who uh, for working in the theater, we hear a lot about negative things going on. And so uh, when we have a chance to, uh, to focus on some good news, we wanna share that. So we thank Vicki for working hard uh, with the theater and uh, helping to bring um, that to our people, our young, our old. Uh, it's very important that we not only focus on the negative, but that we look and uh, we honor God for the good things. So we just want to thank those to the day. And um, as we prepare to uh, receive the word from our pastor this morning, we're going to ask that you um, like, share, and subscribe if you've not already. So that way you can uh, help us to uh, get the word out there that we're here and we're praising God, we honor him and that we appreciate visitors or right, come out and worship with us. So without further ado, I welcome our pastor, Pastor Spencer Clayton will give the word and be blessed. Amen, amen. And so forth. Thanks Deaconess Clayton for that great introduction. You know, one thing I like about us having these services when they're powered by Zoom like this is that, um, yeah, you all get a chance to see a bit more of what we talk about by the people who are working behind the scenes to make things happen. And so we want to thank, of course, Deaconess Clayton, who is always so willing to open up our services when we do them by Zoom this way. Also, as we said, Sister Michiko, who was running the Zoom for me so that all I had to do on these days is come with the sermon and make sure my camera and microphone are ready. So I want to thank her for that. And yet yeah, echo what Deaconess Clayton said all about you know, the great work that she's doing behind the scenes and the great work she's doing across the whole Philadelphia region you know, putting together the history of Black people in the area. And I'll echo what Deaconess Clayton said about Sister Victoria, um, who is working as stage manager on a production of Dream Girls happening in the theater of the X, at the X right now. So, you know, if you have time to go see it, go see it. But that's what I want to just, you know, applaud the fact that we do have some very dedicated people, very humble people who are always working behind the scenes, making sure that this ministry stays afloat while living very active lives as well, you know, because both Sister Michiko and Sister Victoria are leaders in their own right, wherever they are, and they still, well, as people say, count it not robbery to be here and serve this ministry, and so we're thankful for them, and also um, be on the lookout for our flyer. It is on our social media about the church barbecue next week, but we are going to um, share it again. So share it with your friends. You know, We would like for people to RSVP if they're coming just so that we have a general idea of how much food to bring. You know, But we're looking forward to just having a good time and fellowshipping together because we haven't really been able to do that as a ministry as much as we would like. And especially with the pandemic, it's just not all that safe to get together indoors. So this is a good outdoor opportunity for us to come together, you know, lots of land. You can go hiking if you want to. We're going to have some games, of course, some food. I might attempt to bring my ukulele and play some church songs, you know, keyword try. You know, ukulele is not my strong point, but it's there. So you get that. It's just going to be a good time and maybe we'll come together and sing some songs we haven't had a chance to sing in a while. But so we'd love to see you all there. And I'll also add in that this is a time as you know, we are a church that does um, believe in the power of prayer. So if you share your prayer request during service, we will um, get to it and pray for your prayer request before service is out. So again, we thank you all for being here. And as you know, um, well, some of you know, First Lady and I, and of course the baby boy, we were on vacation. We just got back on Friday night and it was good to just be away and have some time to rest and relax and refocus and yeah so I'm thankful for those opportunities but I'll ask just keep us in prayer because of course right before we went on vacation um our refrigerator went and so we do have a new one but those of you who've ever had to replace major appliance like that know that aside from the um 
financial burden that that was. There's also just the idea that, yeah, Arbor food is now kind of still in coolers, gradually coming out of the coolers into the new refrigerator. So we have a lot going on behind the scenes in our house today. Though you look behind me, you can see the nice stainless steel refrigerator. So it's pretty, <laughs> but we still got some work to do. Um, in addition, just getting back to being in the house again from being away for a few days. But but glad to be here, glad to fellowship with you all. Um, and with that, I'm going to take a sip of tea and we're going to jump into the message for today. <clears throat> so if we can all go in our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 41. That is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, beginning at verse 41. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, so I'll give you all some time to um, catch on. But yeah, and as I usually say, um, we encourage you, you know, if this is your first time worshiping with us, or you just want to know more about what we do, fill out a contact card. Uh, we have added that link into the description of this message. I mean, yeah, this service. So if you haven't done it now, you can wait, but afterward, we'd love to hear from you and you'll hear back from us. And also, you got prayer. You can put your prayer requests in the comments below, or you can send them to us um, by contact card if you would like those prayer requests to stay private. And of course, if you just want to donate to further the things we're doing in this ministry, that link is also um, available in our description of today's service as well. But yeah, Matthew chapter six, beginning at verse 41. Feel free to type through an amen when you get there. So I will be reading from the New American Standard Bible and it reads thus. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food and broke the loaves and he kept giving them to his disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied and they picked up 12 full baskets of broken pieces and also of the fish. There were 5,000 men who ate the loaves. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the crowd away. After bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was alone in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking out on the sea, and he intended to pass them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and cried out. So today, if you're taking notes, the title of today's message is Go to the Mountain. That is, Go to the Mountain. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We thank you for the love that exists in this place. Right now, we just pray that you would have your way. You would get the glory out of all that we do, even at this preaching moment, that you would use me as a vessel, that when people hear from you, they will hear from you through me, such that when they hear my voice, they'll hear your voice. When they hear my words, they'll hear your words. When they hear my inflections and intonations, they'll hear yours. So we just pray you would take over this moment and get the glory out of all that we do today. These things we ask for your son, Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so go to the mountain. As a lot of you know, and as I just finished saying, um, first lady, baby boy, and I just got back from a relaxing vacation by the beach. In fact, it was our first time going to Rehoboth Beach as a family, and for me, first time in life too. So that was a nice first that me and the baby boy had a chance to share together. But of course, as a lot of you also know, I tend to struggle with the whole concept of rest and relaxation. In fact, First Lady would easily say that among our earlier vacations together, it was pretty hard to get me not to schedule my itinerary out so hard that I would need a vacation after my vacation. But, you know, she's a good influence in that respect, and I've been getting better with that. 
But I did go on my vacation still this time with a long list of things that I wanted to accomplish. You know, things related to responsibilities that, of course, would get in the way of my ability to rest. Like I had some things I wanted to complete for the church, some business ideas I wanted to explore, some work I wanted to catch up on. You know, so I brought my computer and I brought my iPad and I just had all these grand ideas of how I was going to have all this extra time. And I know what you, some of you are thinking, right? What kind of person goes on vacation and tries to catch up on work while they're there? Well, the answer, this kind of person does that. That's who. But thankfully, in spite of bringing my um, laptop and my iPad, I found the strength not to work. And that ended up being a good thing for me. In fact, my laptop and my iPad stayed in my bag the whole trip, which was good. Because in the process of being away, I felt God bringing me back to this passage of scripture that we're talking about today. And it's a common passage that takes place right after Jesus feeds the multitude and right before Jesus walks on water. Indeed, it's a passage that is sandwiched between two of Jesus' most famous stories. And it's something that we overlook a bit and truth be told, it's something that we don't even realize, we don't even realize that these things all happen back to back, you know? Sometimes we think of Jesus feeding the multitude as happening like all by itself <laughs> and Jesus walking on water that's happening by itself, you know, when really the two events are like one long story. We just tend to cut it up. But after Jesus feeds the multitude, you know, if we read back, we find that Jesus makes a decision to go off to the mountain by himself to pray. You know, and it's a simple action that sets the stage for why Jesus would later have to walk on water. But it also says a lot to us about the importance of believers taking the time to rest and recharge, even at potentially stressful times when there may be a lot of expectations placed on us. And if you don't think Jesus felt any kind of pressure or had any kind of expectations thrown at him, just imagine how you would feel, you know, if even after performing a miracle and turning food that was, you know, pretty much a young man's snack into enough to feed 5,000 people, that those people were still following you and expecting you to do more. You've already taught them. You felt sympathy for them because there was no place they could get food by the time you were done teaching them. So you um, perform this miracle to get them food, and then they're still there. You know, that's pressure. And so we catch that, you know, of course, Jesus bids them farewell, sends his disciples in a boat, and goes off by himself to pray. But the goal of this message is for us to examine the importance of such self-care measures even during high pressure times. And it's my hope that we will be able to learn a great deal on how we can handle these situations in our own lives based on how Jesus handled himself in this situation and in others like it. Because what you find if you study the New Testament is that this was just one of many times that Jesus went off by himself to pray. But before we get to that, I'm gonna give a bit more context and I know I've already said this passage itself is sandwiched between two of Jesus' more famous stories. Um, the better known miracles, you know, he fed the 5,000 with the two fish and five loaves, and he walked on water. But there's also one more thing that occurred right before all this that helps us to give some more context, helps us to understand what was really going on in Jesus' mind and in the mind of the disciples in the midst of all this. So, if you go back to verse 30 of this chapter, and I'm going to go back to read it here, you find that um, Jesus had just heard about the death of John the Baptist. And why is this important? Well, for those who need a bit of review, Jesus and John the Baptist were not just contemporaries. They were family. In fact, they were cousins. And in the Gospel of Luke, we get the account of Mary's pregnancy with Jesus and in that account, it includes her spending time hiding out with her much older cousin, Elizabeth, who was also pregnant. And the baby that she was pregnant with was John. In fact, those of you who know the story will recall that both women were essentially hiding out due to the somewhat scandalous nature of their pregnancies. Um, Mary was unmarried and engaged and pregnant, you know? And Elizabeth was an older woman who was pregnant 
well beyond the years that people would have expected her to be pregnant. You know, she was outside of childbearing years. But yet, in this particular story, we find that even before his own birth, John recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. And his leap, and of course, Jesus acknowledged, I mean, Elizabeth's acknowledgement of John leaping within her womb was the catalyst for Mary going into her amazing speech of praise, now known as the Magnificat. Then it was no accident, even as Jesus got older, that he chose John to be the person that would baptize him. After all, we understand that John's overall ministry was designed to prepare the way for Jesus. John regularly told people, I am not the Messiah you're looking for. I've come to prepare the way. And there were prophecies about, you know, the forerunner of the Messiah. That's who John the Baptist was. So when Jesus finds out that his cousin, John, has been killed, a major detail, not just because of their familial connection, but because John's death would also mean that there was no more need for anyone to prepare for Jesus' way anymore. His ministry was at the point where it was supposed to be. Um, you know, he finds this out, finds out John's been killed, and what does he do? Well, first, he tells his 12 disciples, who were referred to here as the apostles, that they're going to go to a secluded place and rest. So they all get on a boat together for that purpose, because in those days, how much more secluded could you be aside from on a boat in the middle of the sea? Obviously, nobody can access, can access you, at least not too easily. But when that boat arrives to shore, you know, this is like not that far after they find all this out, a large crowd had already formed waiting for Jesus. And the passage says Jesus had compassion on them. So what does he do? He teaches them. And he teaches them so long that they get to a point where they're hungry and there's no place they can get their food. And so Jesus performs the miracle where he's able to extend that food, the two fish and five loaves of bread he's able to find to feed these people. And then, you know, at this point, they're ready to go. And Jesus tells his disciples, you know, get back on the boat and I'll catch up with you later. But right now, I'm going to go to the mountain to pray. So, see, what we can understand by this is that Jesus and his disciples were still working hard to meet the needs of this ministry that was growing in a major way by leaps and bounds. But they were all still dealing with the knowledge of John the Baptist's death and still didn't really have a lot of time to process it. But still, what we see here is with all this happening, Jesus was also aware that if he did not go off to himself to pray, he would have trouble continuing with the rest of his journey, with the rest of his mission, you know, doing all the rest of the things that God called him to do. And I want to make this one thing clear. I am putting Jesus going to the mountain to pray in the category of self-care and rest, because that is what I feel that the mountain represents to all of us. That's why this message is called Go to the Mountain. And why would I do that? Well, it's simple. We know that we can pray to God from anywhere. After all, prayer is a conversation with God, and God is all places at once. And we know that that power was something that was not, you know, something that was accessible to Jesus as well. Like, we see Jesus pray at other times. We see Jesus pray around the miracles he performed. We see Jesus pray, you know, for people who came to him. And we even see Jesus pray while he's on the cross. But we understand that Jesus still had a preference for going off by himself, away from everyone in his life to pray. And why would he do that? Well, because there was some benefit that he got from disconnecting and being alone. And we do like to think this is a deep spiritual practice. Indeed, there are some people with more ascetic lifestyles, think of them as like monks or even nuns in some places, who live their lives in isolation in part because of things like this that Jesus did. They feel that that's their calling to do so. But for the rest of us, we also need to understand that in addition to the spiritual benefits for going away when things are stressful and hectic, there are also practical benefits for taking time to yourself when things are stressful and hectic, like they were for Jesus with at least 5,000 people following him while he's still trying to grieve the loss of his cousin. And for the record, 
all of us as believers, when we have a bit of time to rest and relax, those times should also be the times that bring us closer to God in some way, just as Jesus used that time to pray. Why? You know, because when we have a relationship with God, he really is a part of everything that we do. And spending time with God is not a chore. It's just as natural to us as breathing. I mean, when we got free time, you know, we like to spend time with people who are close to us. Like I can say that the moments that I spent with my family at the beach last week were very refreshing and also brought me closer to God. You know, by understanding these are the people that God has given me. These are my, they are my first ministry. The church is my ministry, but my family is the ministry that comes before the church. In fact, you might even hear baby boy Sawyer crying in the other room. Um, Sawyer and First Lady are sitting off, you know, listening to this message. But um, yeah, what I'm saying is that though, if your relationship with God does feel like a chore, I encourage you to reframe it. And I know that's a whole other message, but for a lot of us, our relationships with God seem like chores because we see them as a series of tasks that we need to perform. And that is something that we need to shift. If you only think about spending time with God as like a checklist, like, oh, I must pray in the morning. I must read X number of verses. I must pop up to church once per week, give this amount of money. Like if your relationship with God is a checklist, you need to rethink that because I can tell you in any, in any other kind of relationship in your life, if those persons, if those people found out they were a checklist, that's not a good relationship. And that's not the kind of relationship God wants from us. And we can talk about it in another message. But for now, we're going to move on to the points related to the mountain. And so here's point number one. One, this is an obvious one, is this. We need to take time to ourselves to recharge. So we know that Jesus, as I said earlier, had just performed one of his better known miracles and was still surrounded by a lot of followers. And we know that this was a crit critical moment in his ministry. He is gaining momentum, you know, as evidenced by the fact that John the Baptist had died. This is the point where Jesus doesn't need anybody to introduce him anymore. Jesus doesn't need anybody to prepare the way for him anymore. He is now at the point where his ministry is like where it's supposed to be it's finally grown to the point that people know who he is. And many of us would assume that this of all times would not be the time for Jesus to do anything that could put that momentum in jeopardy, which of course would make sense by some of our standards today. For instance, I am a music fan and you all know this. I frequently watch shows like Unsung on TV One, you know, shows that talk about why particular artists were not as successful as maybe we all think they should have or could have been based on their talent, based on their, based on their style, based on a lot of things. But what's the answer? Why couldn't they be as successful as they should have been? The answer usually is that their record companies didn't know how to capitalize on the momentum surrounding them. See, often the record companies would wait too long to release material or to dedicate money to marketing a project. So the result of that missed momentum is that the artist's songs never got the kind of attention they deserved. In some cases, they never were exposed to the audiences they should have been exposed to. Maybe not enough money was placed in their um, music video budget. You get the idea that in the end, in the music industry, you kind of strike while it's hot. And some record companies just didn't do that for certain artists. So we can think like, well, yeah, this makes sense. This is a time period where Jesus is hot. You know, Thousands of people are following him. He knows what his overall mission is. Like maybe this wouldn't be the time for him to slow down if his goal is to have as many people know who he is as possible. But then here is another example if music isn't your thing. Maybe you can understand politics a bit more. So we can recall in 2004 when then Illinois State Senator and U.S. Senate candidate Barack Obama was invited to give the keynote address at the Democratic National Convention. This is, of course, after he won his primary. So he was expected to, you know, win that general election and become a senator, which we know he did. But this made him a rising star in the Democratic Party. And his speech that he gave was so well received that it placed him on a short list of potential presidential candidates, even though, as I've said, he had not yet won his election to the U.S. Senate. 
there was a lot of momentum surrounding Obama at that time, such that if he had taken a break, he may not have ended up having the illustrious career that we know that he had. The result of this properly, properly utilized momentum is the fact that Obama, for all intents and purposes, went from a relative political unknown to president in just a matter of four years. So I know I gave two very contrasting examples here, one in which momentum is missed and one in which momentum is properly utilized. But that was just to get us to understand why some of us may be afraid to take the time that we need to refresh and recharge when things just start building up for us. But that's exactly what Jesus does in this passage. He bids those followers farewell, and then he goes off to the mountain to pray. Like, how many of us would have been able to do that? I'm pretty sure that not only would many of us have been unable to do it, but many of us would have even questioned Jesus' motivation. I mean, we would have suggested that he just didn't want to be a leader because real leaders never rest. And that's true. We live in a society today that values hustle and grind over anything else. But Jesus offers us an alternative to this. And in going off to pray, he reminds us that sometimes getting away is really the best thing we can do in order to ensure that we have the strength to continue to do whatever it is God has called us to do. So this brings us to my second point. So the first point in recapping, we really do need to take the time to ourselves to recharge. But the second point is this, while we take the time to ourselves to recharge, we may fall behind. So while we go to the mountain to take the time to recharge, we may fall behind. So with all the benefits that we usually discuss when it comes to the idea of self-care, one thing we don't discuss is that sometimes taking care of ourselves actually does result in us falling behind. Whether it's our schedule, whether it's the schedule that other people have set for us, you know, sometimes we can't do everything and stay with the schedule that we are trying to keep up with. So in this passage, Jesus falls behind literally. He tells his disciples to leave him and travel on their boat. But we know that Jesus is heading to the same place as his disciples. He just accepted that by going off to pray, he was not going to get there with them. Now, for some of us, we will not slow down to recharge because we are too afraid to miss any kind of opportunity that could come our way. And of course, when we slow down, we really do miss opportunities. But guess what? We need to understand that the opportunities that we miss in the name of recharging, in the name of rejuvenating ourselves, in the name of refreshing ourselves, are opportunities that God did not want us to have anyway. What do I mean by that? Well, just like I often say that not every problem that comes our way is ours to solve, not every opportunity that comes our way is ours to take. And I know that this can be difficult for some of us to understand because I, like many of you, was the kind of person that would try my best to take advantage of every opportunity that came my way. It didn't matter how busy I was or how tired I was. I was just thankful for the chance to be used by God. But sometimes I would find myself incredibly tired and sullen and I'd find myself praying to God for more energy. And truth be told, Sometimes I would find myself griping to God about not having the energy to do all the things that he was calling me to do. And sometimes it would be the point, to the point of me not even feeling like I had any time for myself to just take a deep breath. But one day when I would gripe, I felt God respond. And he reminded me this, that he had already given me everything I needed to do to do the things that he had called me to do. And that the reason I was exhausted was because I just kept adding to the list, meaning that I was doing things that I wasn't called to do. Because, you know, I had more than enough time, more than enough resources, more than enough energy to do the things that were within my purview, the things that God wanted me to do, the things I was designed to do. But I was so busy taking every opportunity that came my way that. I had started doing a bunch of other things that are making it hard for me to be effective in things God had called me to do. So from then on, my prayer shifted from basic, use me, Lord, 
to help me to see which roles are mine to fill. And I learned I had to be more specific or else people and by extension, the enemy could easily get me sidetracked just by showing me an opportunity that was good at face value, even if that opportunity just was not what God had for me. And I'm sure that many of you can relate to this as well. And it is hard for people like us when we see opportunities that look promising and acknowledge that we can't take those opportunities because the timing is wrong. But like I said before, even the good opportunity at the wrong time is not an opportunity that God wants us to take. So I have a challenge for all of you who are listening right now. How do you feel about saying no? Are you able to walk away from something that you feel responsible for? Even just for a little while? And no, I'm not talking about leaving your kids hungry or something of that nature. But what I am saying is, even with the responsibilities that you do have to keep up with, are you able to find a few spare moments just to breathe, just to relax, and just to be refreshed? Why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because some of us really do feel like the world will fall apart if we stop for a few minutes to take care of ourselves. And here's the thing, sometimes it will, but we do have power over that as well. And what do I mean by that? Well, I talked a bit about this in some recent sermons, but some of us do create situations where we literally are the only people who can get things done. And we do that so that we're always needed. It's our way of feeling special. It's our way of feeling um, validated. Some of us like that kind of humble brag about how important we are to make sure that things keep moving. Never mind the fact that we created that sense of dependency on ourselves by not training other people to do what we do. But if we look at this particular example, we can see that even Jesus, who was literally the Messiah, and thus the only one who could save our souls, found time to slow down and reflect. And he had all power in his hands. And Jesus also spent his whole ministry training his disciples to continue to move forward after he left so that he knew that his ministry would not die with him. Jesus knew that taking care of himself and training his disciples to pick up where he left off were things that he would have to do to ensure that the mission of his ministry would continue. And that even if those things may appear to slow him down in a moment and put him behind and capitalizing on the ministry, on the momentum behind his ministry, that those things were worthwhile. Still, though I have one more thing I'd like to argue is that even though we may fall behind in some ways when we go to the mountain, to our mountain to recharge, we may also give ourselves more time to get things done. And what do I mean by that? There is such a thing as working ourselves into an early grade. Some of you can think of the story of John Henry, which was the birthplace of the term John Henryism. So the story is this, John Henry, was a folk hero, a black man who was integral to the building of railroads. In fact, he was so supposedly so efficient that the story goes that they were building a tunnel and he had his hammer and he felt that he could beat this steam powered rock drilling machine by building this hammer, I mean, building this tunnel with just him and his hammer. And the story goes that he actually did beat the drilling machine and he was victorious and it was great but right after he won the race that he for some reason challenged this um, steam-powered rock drilling machine to his heart gave out and he died and we all know people or have heard of people who work themselves to death out of fear of being left behind whether it's by life in general whether it's by technology as in the case of john henry there are people who will just work and work and work and work and work themselves to an early grave. And this is especially true of people of color as well as other marginalized groups. I know that in my life, like, you know, I went to Yale and we would talk about how, especially that early generation of black men that went to Yale, a lot of them were dying like in their forties and like under 50. And the reasoning that a lot of us came up with for why they died so young was John Henryism. Because sometimes when you are a, a person of a marginalized group, you feel like you have a lot of pressure on you to make sure that you do the best and breaking barriers and all so that others can come behind you. 
you know, so I'm saying that that kind of pressure we put on ourselves, sometimes we do it for the right reason. We may feel that the stakes are high and we can't slow down because if we do, we'll be left behind. And not only will those opportunities never come again for us, those opportunities won't come again for those behind us either. But I want to remind us though that slowing down may just be the right thing to do because after all, we will not be around to keep working and keep breaking down barriers like that if we're dead. So now this brings me to my final point. So just in recapping, the first point is we do need to take time to go to our, I guess, metaphorical mountains to recharge. But when we go to the mountain to recharge, we may actually fall a bit behind. And so the last point is this, even when we fall behind, God has a way of bringing us back to where we need to be. And this is the encouraging part of this message because it was clear that Jesus really did fall behind physically. But when he, refin but when he finished recharging through prayer on the mountain, God found a way to bring him back to where he needed to be, which in this case was the boat with his disciples. See, the thing we have to understand is that God is not subject to our logic. The idea of walking on water is something that was unheard of. We know that Jesus' disciples were kind of thrown off by this when they saw Jesus walking on the water, enough that they actually thought he was a ghost. But see, that is how God moves in our lives. When we trust God, we will actually find ourselves having those walk on water moments. You know, we're going to stretch the definition a bit because see, we often focus on the meaning of walking on water for Jesus' disciples and how it increased their faith. You know, in one account, Peter walked on water with him. But let's talk about the practical benefits for Jesus as well. The fact is, Jesus really needed to get away and spend time with God in prayer. He was busy, he was drained, he was tired, he was grieving the loss of his cousin. But Jesus also needed to be with his disciples when they got off the boat. And God did make a way for him to do both even if it's a way that none of us could have ever predicted. You see, sometimes God will create ways for us to do all the things he wants us to do. And those things may seem impossible together, but with God, you know, even the possible, even the impossible becomes possible with God. So knowing this, we need to follow Jesus' example of going off to pray as self-care and having faith to know that when we are taking care of ourselves the way God wants us to, everything is going to work out, even if it doesn't work out according to our timeline. Now, I'm not for the record saying that we should blow off our responsibilities under the guise of self-care. So don't say that that's what I told you. You know, the fact is that there are some people who are lazy and would just use self-care as an excuse to do nothing. And I wouldn't ever support that, neither would Jesus. But what I am saying is that we should feel comfortable extending ourselves enough grace to rest and recharge every now and then. And that, as I've said in previous sermons, we need to stop viewing self-care as a luxury. The reality is that a big part of Jesus' effectiveness in ministry came from the time he spent resting and refreshing with God through prayer. And I also want to add in one thing here, which is this. Sometimes our timelines are just wrong. You know, God knows when we need to do what we need to do. Sometimes we're wrong. And why I'm bringing this up is so we understand that anybody, let's say, looking in from the outside might have thought that Jesus' goal was to be known by as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. But there were actually times where Jesus said, you know what, uh, it's not my time yet. It's not my time yet. So there were times when Jesus knew that he had to slow down because if he received too much attention, that would have only accelerated the process by which the Pharisees and Sadducees and other religious leaders came to know who he was and began plotting his death. So why I'm bringing this up is that sometimes we have ourselves on a timeline that God didn't even have us on. But now I'm going to come to the conclusion of this message. So in case you haven't noticed, there is a clear theme in these messages that God has been giving me recently. You see, I can poke fun at people who have trouble slowing down because I am one of them, even if it's just slowing down to pray. But what God has been saying to me and to those of you who are like me is clear. God wants us to think about the long game and not what we can do in the short term. What do I mean by this? Well, 
to make sense of it using a phrase that a lot of us have heard before, life is a marathon and not a sprint. Now that sounds pretty basic, but if you've tried to run either a marathon or a sprint, you understand. It's true, yes. Distance running and sprinting are both two kinds of running. Both require training, but both are also incredibly different. Because see, if you're a sprinter, you give everything you have for a very short period of time. You know, and I should credit my mom for me knowing all about sprinters because my mom, that's one of the things she'd always watch when the Olympics were on, when the world championships were on. In fact, we'll still talk about it now. Like I was raised watching people like Carl Lewis or like Michael Johnson. And even with the more recent like world championships this year, it was great to see how Noah Lyles finally beat Michael Johnson's record in the 200. You know, so I like watching a good sprinter as much as a lot of you would like watching a good sprinter. But in fact, it should be no surprise that I operate naturally more or less as a sprinter, both when I exercise and when I'm working. I'm great for short bursts of effectiveness to get things done. But the problem is that there is no way to sprint through life. We can try, but our bodies are just not designed to do that. We cannot cover the distance that God has for us to cover in life if all we know how to do is sprint. Now, in contrast to sprinting, marathon runners and other distance runners have to learn how to pace themselves. They learn to adjust their breathing. They learn to adjust their speed. They learn to adjust their technique to ensure they can cover that long 26.2 miles of distance. And while they are considered to be fast and can still run faster than the average person, even while they're doing their marathon pace, it's important to note that the top speed of a marathoner is still much slower than that of a sprinter. And that someone watching them from the sidelines might think, wow, that marathoner is just wasting time. I mean, they should just be running as quick as the sprinter over here. But that's not the case because the marathoner has just conditioned themselves to be able to cover far more distance before needing to rest. And if you've ever seen some sprinters, they really can't maintain that speed for too long. Like, what is it for men? 100 meter dash is like less than 10 seconds. They've got to run that speed. They can only maintain that speed for maybe a little more than that. You know, while marathon runners can run for hours. But see, that's our problem. Sometimes we're so afraid of being judged, like say some people judge the marathon runner versus the sprinter, that we push ourselves harder than we should. Some of us are not called to sprint. Some of us are not called to do things that can be accomplished in a series of sprints. But we're too busy trying to live up to the expectations of a society that values speed and busyness to realize that we may actually be designed to live a different way entirely. So as we end this message, I want all of us to remember this. Jesus went to the mountain so we would know that it's okay for us to take time away, even at times of high pressure. In fact, it's actually encouraged. That's not to say that we should shirk on our responsibilities. But if we want to make sure that we are healthy enough to do what God has called us to do, we can't run ourselves into the ground. We can't be like John Henry, whose victory ultimately led to his premature death. And as I've said, I know that it's difficult. I have conversations with my friends about this all the time. It's like, are we pushing ourselves too hard? You know, are we letting our pressure, the pressure that we feel to make a difference, put us in unhealthy situations? But we can't fall into that trap. Instead, we have to have the faith to believe that if God is telling us to slow down, he will still find a way to get us to where we need to be, when we need to be there just like he did for Jesus. So don't be afraid to go to the mountain to rest. God bless you all. So now we are going to open the doors of the church after I take another sip of tea. <clears throat> so I know I talked about, you know, the importance of resting like Jesus did, the importance of going off to ourselves even at stressful times, just to process what's happening, just to recharge, just to give ourselves a chance to be better. But you may be wondering, well, how do I do this? Like, I know you said that Jesus is our model. Jesus is who we're supposed to follow as believers. 
but I don't even know where to begin. Well, to begin with this, you can start by praying this prayer that I have right now. It comes out of the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, which says, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, if you confess with your mouth, how, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. And being saved is the beginning of building that personal relationship with God, that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where he will reveal to you, as I said with my prayers earlier in this message, the projects that are yours and those that are not, the opportunities that you should take and the opportunities that you should pass by, the problems that you're supposed to solve and the problems that you're supposed to let someone else solve. You'll only know those things by building that personal relationship with God. So if you would like to begin that step to build that personal relationship with God right now, just pray this prayer with me. Say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. If you prayed that prayer with me today, congratulations, you are now a believer and we would love to hear from you. So you can write it in the comments. You can send us a contact card. You know, as I said earlier, the links for the contact card is in the description of this message. And we will pray with you and help you figure out your next steps as a believer. You'll hear from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. And we will just help you figure out your next steps, whether the, those steps are to become a member of your world Christian ministries, whether you would like to be more or less an affiliate online member, maybe you're not local, or whether you're somebody who really needs a church where you can worship physically wherever you are. We'd love to help you in, in any respect. So, so reach out to us and we will pray with you. Or maybe you are somebody who already identifies as a believer, but you would like to, or you feel God putting it on your heart that you are meant to be a part of your world Christian ministries. Maybe you've been looking for a church that is not afraid to talk about complex issues or have uncomfortable conversations. Maybe looking for a church that believes that social justice is a part of the gospel and not in addition to the gospel. Maybe you're looking for a church that is looking for a way to bridge gaps in society and to break down barriers and to break down um, all structures of oppression. You know, if that is you, I encourage you to also fill out the contact card or to leave us a message. You can send us a direct, direct message. You can leave it in the comments, but you will hear back from me or from our past. I mean, no, obviously I'm our pastor, but you'll hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. And you'll hear back from us. We'll pray with you, help you figure out your next steps, whether you would like to partner with us so that we can help you to do what our tagline says, you know, live God's will for your life, whether you'd like to help us to do some of the things that we're doing behind the scenes, which we will have a great announcement about next week. Whatever it is, if God has placed it on your heart to be a part of us, we'd love to hear from you. Or maybe you're somebody who's in need of prayer. I've already seen some prayer requests coming through, <clears throat> but maybe you are somebody who, you know, needs us to pray, whether you need us to pray along with you or to intercede on your behalf. Whatever it is you need, we believe in the power of prayer. And in fact, if you say your prayer request right now or we're watching live, we will share your prayer request. Not well, we will share your prayer request, of course. We will pray for your prayer request during service. But if you'd like it to be more private or if you just send it to us after service is over, we will still pray for you on the side. But if you have prayer requests, feel free to put them in right now. And I see some coming through. Or lastly, for somebody who wants more information about what we do here at Your Will Christian Ministries, um, fill out a contact card and we will add you to our mailing list. You'll know about things we're doing, like other events we're going to have, the announcement that we're going to have this coming week, um, when our women's ministry comes back, and just any other events that we may have. So with that, I see that our prayer requests are, going, are coming through, so I'm going to give a little bit more time for those to come through. And I am going to take another sip of tea because I can feel myself trying to cough. <clears throat> Okay, so I see two prayer requests that have come through. 
So I want to thank you all for just the love that exists in this place, for your willingness to even share. So now I am going to close out in prayer. But for those of you who are wondering, I still may open my eyes from time to time because sometimes prayer requests still keep coming through. So let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We thank you that you have shown us that we can go to the mountain to rest and to recharge and that it's okay to step away for a little bit to get ourselves together when things are going wrong, when things are just overwhelming. But we just thank you for the example that you've shown that even while you sent your son in the, to, to live among us, as he went through all the things that we went through, that even while having all power in his hands, he still was able to model the kind of life that we should lead in the face of challenges. And we thank you for that. We thank you for this ministry. We thank you for the love that exists here. We thank you for the vision that you've been revealing to us behind the scenes. And we pray that you would just help us to truly walk in that truly take the steps that we need to take in order to be who you've called for us to be. But right now we pray because we know that that's what this sermon was about. You will also help us to identify which things are ours to solve, which causes are ours to promote, which opportunities are ours to take, and which times are necessary for us to rest so that we can truly be who you've called us to be and be the best example of what you would have for us to be in this world. So right now, we come before you on behalf of the prayer requests that have been shared. <clears throat> we thank you for Sister Victoria. We pray that you would keep her healthy, um, that you would just keep her. We know that she's had a lot of doctor's appointments, but we pray that you would just help her to know that you are Jehovah Rapha, her healer. Help her to know that you have everything under control, that you are working through those doctors that she's seen and that you are with her no matter how she may be feeling right now. We also pray about her job, um, that we know that she has been fortunate to continue to find more employment opportunities. But just like we said with this message, help her to know which opportunity is the one that she should take. Help her to find you. She is blessed with her background that she can always find a job, but help her to find the job, the one that you want for her to have right now. And we just pray for the cast, of course, and Dream Girls, the cast and crew of Dream Girls. Be with them, you know what's hot. Um, and just, we pray for their safety as well, as we know that there's still a lot of concerns about going to any large scale event in not just Philadelphia, but in cities across the country because of this epidemic of gun violence. And we also pray and continue to pray that you will help us as a ministry figure out what we can do to address this epidemic of gun violence, this epidemic of violence in our communities and the issues that are taking place among younger people. Um, we also pray for Sister Michiko's son's healing. Um, we again know that you can do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. And we know that Sister Michiko and her husband, they love you and they trust you and they are believing you for their son's healing. So we pray that you would just work on their behalf, that you would take care of that situation as only you can. We're thankful that he still has his moments of clarity and that he still will come home. And we just pray that you will continue to just move in him Show yourself to him. Take care of those places in him that need to be taken care of. Let him know that you love him and that you care for him. Bring about that clarity of mind that he so needs. And we pray for any other prayer requests that have been spoken, any other ones that have been typed that we may have missed, any that may remain on people's hearts. We just pray that you will have your way and that you would show yourself that you would bring about a resolution to any problems that we have, that you would bring about a blessing to all those who need one. And we just pray that we would continue to be um, vessels for you 
such that wherever we go, people will come to know more about you as they interact with us, that your light will shine through us. We pray that you will continue to have your way. And we just love you. And we pray now as we leave this service and go back to our respective lives, that your angels will continue to camp round about us and that you would just pour into us and show us who we are meant to be, both as this body of believers known as your will and as individuals in whatever context you've placed us. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all, and God willing, we'll see you next week for service, and we'll see some of you a little before that at the barbecue. God bless.